The Psalms are prayers and hymns of the Bible par excellence. Uttered in praise, joy, sorrow, and despair, spoken or sung in private and in public. By lay people, kings, poets, and priests, coming from both the righteous and repentant sinners, the Psalms have served as the prayer book and the hymn book. To generations of believers, for every man on every occasion can find in its Psalms. Hello, good morning once again. Welcome to Whispering Hope Daily Sabbath School Lesson Study. And here with us this week are Dr. K. White and Dr. Wayne Knowles to close out this quarter for us. What a wonderful study we had of the Psalms this week. I know if your regular host was in with us, she would have asked for you to give your favorite Psalm, but I'm going to ask you to greet the people first, and then we'll go into that segment of the preliminaries. And before we float into this lesson and close it out this week, Dr. White, would you be so kind to greet our viewers this morning? And then you allow lady. They always say ladies first. So, All right. Good morning to everyone. It's a joy to be back today on Whispering Hope Sabbath School. It's always a pleasure to be here. And as we've come to the end of such an exciting and interesting lesson study on the Psalms, we know today God is ready to speak to us. I'm very excited to be here excited to bring this lesson to a close today good morning and dr knowles how about you there relaxing like you've been having a great week well the week has been good and i just want to give god thanks for another day as i say each morning it's a good day it's a great day it's a wonderful day to be alive and to have a relationship with god i hope and trust that as we go into this last section of this quarter's lesson that it will be a blessing to each and every one of us. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're going to look at first your favorite psalm. I know that you would have shared a few with us, but there's so many psalms, and I get into trouble whenever I'm asked to share my favorite psalm because there's so many of them that has been a blessing to me over the years. So Dr. Knowles, what would be your favorite psalm to share with us this week? It's the final week, so you have a bite. You could give us two. Well, we have given so many. How many? This would make about 13. So, <laughs> But there's so many favorite Psalms, actually. You could give more than two. One of them is highlighted in the lesson today, and that's Psalm 37. It says, do not fret, or the King James Version says, fret not because of evil doers, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green grass, they will soon die away. This is this is really very loaded because as we look at life, sometimes it appears as though the wicked is prospering. Sometimes they are in the material things of this world. And we wonder sometimes what's happening to us. But the Bible says that they are like the grass, which will soon wither. And uh, like green plants, they will soon die away. It's temporary. And that's the point that it's making. But we have an e eternal inheritance in Christ. So we shouldn't fret over the evil to a success. We should be confident and comfortable in the fact that we have an internal inheritance in Christ. We may get blessings here in terms of material prosperity, but even if we don't, we have a great future with God that will give us eternal hope and security. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Um, um, Dr. White, what are your favorite Psalms? I will share one. Psalm 20 has been a Psalm over the years. I've really uh, appreciated and I've shared with many individuals. But I just want to highlight verse 6. The Bible says, Now I know the Lord saved his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. This is such good news this morning uh, because uh, David is indicating here that God will save. So God has the ability to save, uh, but not only will he save, he will save his anointed. So there is a blessing when we live for God, when we stand on the side, side of God. And he continues, he will hear him from his holy heaven. And his holy heaven is really his seat of authority. And I love how the verse continues. He will not only hear him with the seat of authority, which is the holy heaven, but with the saving strength of his right hand. And I always say, you know, there's no need for God to use a right hand. You know, in the context of 
human beings. The right hand is the skilled hand. But God, there's no need for God to use a right hand. He spoke the world into existence. But we see the psalmist using human terms that we can understand. That if God is going to use his right hand, have mercy. He is going to deliver. He is going to save his anointed. And so today we rejoice in our God who is more than able. So that would be my psalm today, Psalm 20 and verse 6. Dr. Knowles and Dr. White, this week they have chosen one of my favorite psalms, something that I learned early in life, Psalm 92, which says, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Sometimes the psalms can be a blessing, but we're go going to go right into our preliminaries. Now we're going to ask Dr. Knowles to pray for us, and then Dr. White will read for us our memory text. Let us pray, Father God, as we're about to open your word, we ask for your Holy Spirit's guidance and blessing. May we be the student and may your Holy Spirit be the teacher. And may we learn lessons of life that will transform our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Our lesson study today, the final, as we bring it, bring the, the book of Psalms to a close. It's been a very exciting, exciting week. Well, journey, the last 13 weeks, as Dr. Knowles um, shared. Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. And he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Our topic for this week is wait on the Lord. And that's the way we are concluding this powerful lesson, the powerful study of the psalm. Uh, we talked about how can we sing this Lord's song in a strange land. But after we have studied that, people become disillusioned. And even the psalmists themselves became disillusioned. They complain and they fret. Asaph said he became envious. And sometimes they become impatient with how the wicked was prospering. And they're still asking us now, as we conclude, to wait on the Lord. How, how would you say to me that after I've been through all these challenges and murmuring and complain, why should I still wait on the Lord? But before you answer that question, could you put our topic for this week? Your Dr. White could put the topic for this week in context. Yeah, the topic, wait on the Lord, has just about, six words and the emphasis here is not just the weight it's on who you're waiting on it really makes a difference who you're waiting on but he has weight on uh, four words who you're waiting on is what matters most because there's a difference if you're going to wait on me or something i can't provide right you can wait until death comes. I may not be able to ever provide it. I can promise you something, and at somewhere along the, the, the road, I may become unable to provide it. But when we look at the emphasis of the Lord, it really speaks to a sense of assurance that God is able to provide. You see, who you wait on really makes a difference. And with God, you can wait on him for anything that he promises because he has the capacity, the ability, the best timing, and he knows how best to provide whatever he has promised. So the topic is really significant because it's teaching us a lesson, not just about God, but also about ourselves as well. Are we willing to trust in him by waiting on him? Amen, amen, amen. So there is a call for us as Dr. Moshe to wait on the Lord. I, I'm very happy that he highlighted we are waiting on God. But there's an intentional call for us to wait on the Lord. Isaiah 40 and verse 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So we see the psalmist reoccurring this very concept coming out here from the book of Isaiah of waiting on God. So there's an intentional call for us uh, to wait. And whether or not we want to wait on God or not, just the fact that we live on a planet and one of these days we will not be on this planet, we have to wait. Uh, we can say, I want Jesus to come tomorrow. Yes, he may come tomorrow, but until he comes, we, we have to wait. I may say, well, I want God to provide this blessing in my life. He will not move in the way I may want him to move. So I have to wait. So as we consider the fact we're human, we're finite, that God is eternal, that God is the supreme God who knows everything. And because of our limitations, 
that waiting is a part of the human experience. We can't run from it. We can't escape it until we see our God face to face. We'll always be in this position of waiting. But it's a good thing. And I believe as we continue the discussion, we'll show the benefits of waiting because it's a good thing to wait, as Dr. Noel said, on, on the Lord. And so that point brings us right into our memory text, Dr. White. And so you'll take the first bite. You read it and you have just ended on a powerful pointer. So what is our memory text saying to us? Put the memory text into context this week. Yes, I like the fact the writer makes a direct appeal here to wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, which simply means the, that waiting on God will not be an easy task. And so the writer has to assure the individual who's waiting, as you wait, I'm encouraging you to take heart, be courageous, because God is going to strengthen you in the process of waiting. So there is something which happens in our lives when we wait on God. There is a transformation that can take place. There is a strength which God wants to give to us that may not be realized until we wait on him. And then he re -echoes, he re echoes the point, wait, I say, on the Lord. So there must be a benefit in waiting, in trusting uh, in God. And I think this is a, a very exciting memory verse as we consider who we are, but we also consider who God is. Yeah, but it, it's important. And just to add to what Pastor White just shared, the text itself says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Notice the results, the expected results. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So the wait at the beginning and the emphasis at the end is speaking to what is expected in the middle, that he will strengthen your heart. But as you said, the context, this is the very last verse in Psalm 27. What comes before is important. The challenges, the teachings of God, when the psalmist gets to that point, the issues of life that he's struggling with, what God has taught him, he comes to this point. Waiting on God comes in the context of a relationship with God. The man who does know God doesn't know how to wait on God. He doesn't know that he can trust in God. But when we look at the experience, and then if we go to actually the previous verse, verse 13, hear what the psalmist says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So we see how that builds up, that a person can easily lose heart if they do not have that relationship with God, that knowledge of God. And the conclusion is having that knowledge, having gone through my experience and journey with him, I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'll be of good courage. And, and I know that he will strengthen my heart. So I'm just going to wait on the Lord. So waiting is not out of the context of a relationship. You know persons in relationship when they wait. I mean, if a stranger comes to me and tells me, wait there for that person, after the time pass, I may give the person an extra five minutes. But if my dad told me to wait, I know my dad. I know he's going to come. I know he's going to come through. So I'll wait forever. Because I know he's not going to abandon me or leave me. So the relationship is what gives context to waiting. In fact, the, the Hebrew word here for waiting says wait in faith. So it's not the faithless who is called upon to wait, but the faithful. And by waiting, our faith will increase as well. So we have been waiting, but not waiting in vain. Because our host is here. So <laughs> we've been waiting Hallelujah. at this moment, but we've been waiting on our host. Good morning, Madam Host. Happy to have you in the house. And I can't do the job as you well as you do it. So the stage well, is up. <laughs> well, a little waiting is not bad because today is actually my birthday. So you can oh, wait for the whole Can wait for the whole Happy, birthday, so happy birthday, Madam Challenger. How the pastor kept that a secret from us? I don't know. <laughs> Take that up with him. So, my humblest apologies. I think because it's a birthday, you know, I, I get a little leverage for being late today, but it was, yeah, but forgive me. You are forgiven and happy birthday to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Happy birthday. So, I want to thank my able co host. We're going to ask him to stay on and co host with us today. It's not normal. We have the man behind Whispering Hope on us here on a Friday morning. 
So he is going to either co-host or I'll be a panelist. It's up to him, whichever one he chooses to be. But I'm happy he is locked in, tuned in, on set with us this morning. And so waiting, you know, I asked this question last lab, but, but I'm going to ask the husbands on here. Pastor White, Dr. White, you'll get away. Waiting. I heard Dr. Nose talk about his waiting experience for his dad. Is that the same experience on waiting for your wife? So, gentlemen, how long did you wait on the wedding day? And don't tell me like the others who made arrangements and their wives were early. I, I want to see if these wives are traditional. So let's 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 do the opening right there and there. I my wife didn't have me waiting on my wedding day. We actually, I would actually say we both got there about the same time. But to be honest and to fear to her, she got there a little earlier than I did. So she had to make a little swing because as soon as I was pulling up, she was already there. So I was, we had an agreement that we weren't going to have that long waiting period like some people punish their husbands for an hour. <laughs> well, mine was quite the opposite. We had the, the plan, but it just didn't work. <laughs> My wife had a hairdresser situation that she could not have any control over. And so she ended up very late, about an hour and 45 minutes late. So I, I had to wait. And in those days, they weren't cellular phone days. So you had to wander for a little bit. And her dad had to be telling me, she'll come, she'll come, you know, waiting something, you need someone to encourage you along the way. Then I heard it was a hairdresser situation. And then I, you know, when you know what the issue is, you kind of a little more confident. When you don't know, you know, then you have, you're wondering why. But knowledge really makes a difference. So, yes, I, I did wait a long time and I would have waited even if it took four hours. So I'm happy to wait for her. Well, amen. You know, Dr. Knows, you're the only husband that I've interviewed so far that waited all the others made arrangements i don't know how they threatened them but their their significant other their wives to be fall in line but i think i'm like sister Rhonda. i was late not an hour and 45 minutes late but i was late you know you have to let them anticipate you know and thinking of the delay and it's likened to the bridegroom story right so somebody needs to wait don't you agree well, my wife said it was a hairdresser. She she's not claiming that she let me wait. <laughs> Any which way? Any so, which way? Waiting. Yeah. You know, I know as a child, and you tell somebody wait, they'll say, "Oh, wait is a heavy load." So, with that mind in mind, why is waiting significant in our spiritual lives? Yeah, I would say waiting is critical as we consider our spiritual lives because it is god's intention to really build our spiritual character to allow us to be more like him as we consider the fact that god tries us and in trying us his aim is really to purify us that we will come forth as gold that is critical in the spiritual walk but also when god has a plan to allow us to move from one level to another level in our spiritual walk he will additionally try us through the waiting process so that we can be more like him so waiting is really to our benefit as we consider the plans god has in store for us the salvation he would like to give us every single day anything that will try us and test us and build our character he will do that and i believe waiting is one of those areas one of those methods god will continue to use until he comes for us to grow to be more like him excellent point i am actually doing a book on prayer and one of my chapters is entitled wait on the lord in prayer and uh, the very verse for scripture reading is what the focus is and i'll just share a snippet of that it begins by saying waiting on the lord is a spiritual virtue just as pastor white was just saying it, it builds character it shapes so you're building virtue waiting on the lord is a spiritual virtue Hence, it is a blessing and not a burden to wait on the Lord. I'm not saying waiting on the wife is, wasn't a burden, <laughs> but waiting on the Lord is a blessing, not a burden. To wait on the Lord is actually, and I touched on this in the memory text, 
to demonstrate confident expectation in God. And uh, Pastor White shared a passage, when we wait, he will renew our strength. So there's that confident expectation that we have. And so the, the Hebrew word for wait may also be translated hope. So we're not waiting in a vacuum. We wait in the context of that relationship we have with God, that expectation, that confidence. And so to wait on the Lord simply means to hope in God. When you hope, it means you don't have it yet, but you expect to have it. And so this weight that we're speaking about is really about having an expectation that God will come through. And who is the best person to wait on? God. If we cannot wait on God, if we do not have that virtue in our life, then as they say, crap or smoke your pipe, because it means we don't have faith and confidence in God. Amen. You know, we're shifting the discussion now to experience of waiting of some of our biblical heroes and of faith and how did waiting purify and strengthen your faith and the first text we look at is romans 4 19 to 12 which talks about the experience of abraham being a hundred years old and his wife being 90 years old and they're waiting for this promised child now biologically it seems highly impossible you know she would have been out of her days of menstruation, having an egg to meet a sperm. And so this waiting, talk to us about this particularly. And Hebrews talk about faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it talks about this faith hall of fame. And so how did this experience particularly strengthen and purify the faith of our Bible heroes? I think we just touched on that very principle that faith is about hope, hope. Waiting is about hoping in God. It's about expecting him. And this is what faith really is. Faith is about believing that God is going to come through. And so you cannot be faithful without being hopeful. And that's what waiting on God is. You have confidence that God is going to go, come through. And so you anchor your trust and faith and belief in him. And this is what we would see in the hall of faith that we, is the, that the hall of faith that is described in Hebrews chapter 11. All the people of faith waited on God. They trusted in God and expected God to come through for them. So the example you gave with Sarah, once the promise was given and it seemed impossible, they waited on God, they hoped in God. And they trusted in God for that to become a reality. So waiting is a virtue that we all need in our experience. Waiting on God, that is, is that virtue. Amen. Amen. I just want to add the whole aspect of character building. And we've been emphasizing this for the last few, few minutes. The waiting aspect and how it builds our character. And I'm thinking of Joseph. Uh, he was given a dream very early. In his life, you're going to be somebody great. But then he goes through a series of events which really did not look positive. And the outlook was really dim. Well, in, I, I suspect in the mind of Joseph, but as he waited on God, he had to wait in Potiphar's house. He had to wait in the prison. But we see in the end, when Joseph is able now to forgive his brothers, when he's able to really demonstrate that level of spirituality, that even though God has promised you something, the waiting has a way of building that character. So when it's realized, it, it somehow God has already prepared you for it. And I, I suspect if God gives us everything right away, we will disregard the God who has done it for us. But as we wait on him, we trust in him, and we also build a closer relationship with him. Amen. What is the end of our waiting? Let's look at Psalms 37, 34 to 40. And it says, Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of the man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. 
He is their strength in time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. And so the question, what is the end of our waiting? That is, what are we promised when all things are finally resolved? Right, as we consider our spiritual journey and, and the waiting process, we will ultimately receive a crown. Um, we speak about the, our eternal inheritance, which Christ has in store for us. And I'm speaking about heaven, uh, that the light affliction, the Apostle Paul says, that we experience here, uh, the waiting that we have to now experience every single day, is nothing in comparison to the glory, uh, to the honor of, of meeting Christ in the kingdom, of honor of spending eternity with him. And so in, in the end, there is that moment of rejoicing, that moment of celebration when that, that time comes. And even in this life, there are times when we have to wait on certain things. The, well, Dr. Knowles shared that he had to, to wait for his wife for uh, an hour and 45 minutes. But at the end, there is rejoicing because now he has his wife, he has a family. And so there's always going to be a moment of rejoicing at the end of the waiting. It is what will happen to us during that period of waiting will really determine how we will respond at the end of the waiting process. If we are disgruntled and if we are angry and if we are frustrated, I didn't get the impression from Dr. Knows that he was angry and frustrated. I got the impression the anticipation created even more enthusiasm and in the end he was able to, to rejoice. Amen. I like your positive emphasis, Pastor White. I want to posit based on your question, Mrs. Challenger, that both verses 34, which begins our passage, and verse 40 speaks to two excellent results. And I also want to say there's some things you get from waiting on certain people. Not everyone can provide the same thing. Waiting on a doctor, you get the issue of your health. Waiting on a lawyer, you get legal. Waiting on a pastor, you may get spiritual counsel. Waiting on a wife, you get relationship. But waiting on the Lord is a very different kettle of fish. What the Lord provides is incomparable to anything else. Because in verse 34, it says, He shall exalt you to inherit the land. So we're going to have an eternal inheritance. That's our end result. And then verse 40 says, that he will not only deliver, but he will save them because they trusted or waited in him. So we have both salvation and an eternal inheritance. That's the end game. And so waiting on the Lord is superior in terms of its benefits than any other. And he can provide anything he promises. When we wait on others, they may fail us, but Jesus will never fail. So it's that confident expectation and hope that we have that he will provide both eternal inheritance and salvation. That's our end result. So keep waiting because one day he that, that will come will not tarry. He will come and he will reward us all. Dr. Dolz, yes, I wanted to ask you a question pertaining to waiting. And you'll be saying you waited for an hour and a half and Sister Dr. White put it in good perspective to say that at the end you have rejoicing but the question i wanted to ask it's so difficult to tell persons today about jesus is coming again and persons have become weary of waiting they're saying that their grandparents waited their grandparents parents waited they have been waiting for so long and still no return of christ what can we say to someone who is concerned about the fact that they may be waiting in vain yeah that question comes when a person is outside when you you know since covid we are uh, we line up outside for many things even when you go to the bank and even today you you're lining up outside you don't know what's happening inside when you get inside the weight changes you can see the end when a person cannot see the end they think differently about the waiting. Some people get out the line because they're not seeing the progress. They can't see the cashier. They can't see what's happening in the line. When a person is not in a firm relationship with Christ, it's the same thing. 
when you have a relationship with Christ, you would have proven him waiting is no longer an issue. And the hall of faith shows that the relationship you would wait forever because there is that, that confidence that you have in Christ. But that question generally comes for persons. And you, when they say that, you know, they don't have that faith that they should have in Christ. So what we say to that person, build your relationship. And I think Psalm 37, the journey that the psalmist went through, he says, teach me your way, right? They need to go back and study the word. They need to go back and see the story of Abraham, Jonah, David, all these patriarchs, how they develop their faith in God and realize that time is not an issue for God because whatever he promised, he's able to. So it's always about relationship when a person is concerned, whether, you know, the grandparents, well, you know, the grandparents waited all their life. You haven't, right? So if they can give and the grandparents may have lived for 95 and you're just 25 and you you can't even wait for another 30, 40 years. So it really speaks to a matter of faith. And when a person would have built their faith in Christ, they, they don't have a problem waiting because they're confident that what was promised will come to pass. So I would say we encourage that person to study more about him so that they can have that confidence in his promises. This other question. What hope do we find in these texts? For instance, about the justice that has so long been missing in our life. I believe this quarter, there was a lot of hope in the Psalms. The, the writer or the psalmists or the writers, they spoke significantly about individuals who are oppressed, individuals who are poor, and the need and the cry for God's justice. Let God arise continues to be the theme in the psalms and, and asking God to arise. I'm um, really asking God to intervene in the situation, asking God to respond to the cry of those who are poor, to those who are in need, to those who are overwhelmed by the situations in, in, in this life. So as we consider the psalms this quarter, there was a, a heavy emphasis on the fact that God is going to vindicate, God is going to bring uh, a change, God is going to intervene in, in the situation. And so there was a lot of hope as we consider the fact that God is hearing the cry of those who need him and God will intentionally respond to them. Amen. Justice is in the hand of the Lord. It's not in my hand or in your hand. And ultimately, it is not in the hand of the government or whoever. They may fail, but ultimate justice is in the hand of the Lord. And so that's why waiting on the Lord for my justice is so important. And uh, Psalm 37, 40 says, And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked. So ultimately, God is the one who will bring justice. And uh, we can hope in that because we have seen the workings of God throughout history. We see what happened in the antediluvian world when the wicked prospered and everything went awry. God is the one that finally brought justice. We see that with the building of the Tower of Babel. We see that with Sodom and Gomorrah. We see that with the children of Israel when they are not faithful to God and follow the ways of the world, what God does. And ultimately, this is what will happen in the end. So we can have confident hope that justice will ultimately take place. I know sometimes we have that impatient streak about us. We want justice and we want it now. You know, we have our, our Christian plaque. We want justice. We want justice now. But ultimately, whether in this life it may come, but the real justice is the blessings that God gives at the end. And if you don't get all that you desire here on earth, he has promised us a better future where the righteous will receive eternal inheritance and the wicked will be destroyed eternally. Amen. I want to thank both of you for your discussion thus far. We shift to Ecclesiastes 9.5 and it says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, but the memory of them is forgotten. Why, as far as the dead are concerned, 
And as far as their own experience goes, is they're waiting for Jesus. Almost done. Well, it, it's almost done because we have this blessed hope and promise. When we go to Revelation, we, we notice what happened when the seal was open and the blood of the martyrs cry out, how long, how long? And he said, just a little while. So the word of God tells us that it's almost done. Those who are righteous will one day rise again. And every single day brings us closer to that particular time. And so we, we must be aware that the promise of God is secure. We can trust in his word that he will come again. And so our waiting for Jesus is almost done. And we believe in the soon coming of Christ, that soon and very soon he will return. And what soon means? It means that Jesus has a time. He says only the father knows the time when he will come. And the good thing about soon and death is that if you die today, the next thing you are aware of is that he comes. So for every person who dies, it is very soon that Christ returns. So we have that hope that the person who dies in Christ, the next thing they will know is the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And soon and very soon, we sing the song, we're going to see, see the king. Revelation 22 and verse 12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And Dr. Lowe quoted the passage which said, He that will come, will come, and he will not, not tarry. As we consider the science found in Matthew 24, and even throughout the Bible, Jesus was able to give us the enough science and knowledge to understand that we are close to the end. And we cannot say the end is tomorrow, but the signs continue to allow us to understand that he is coming, coming soon. And so a time will come when those who die in the Lord, the Bible says, they will rise again. They will be able to see him and live with him. And so this is the hope. And that's what the, you know, waiting creates that expectation, that anticipation. And that anticipation is a good thing because as we're waiting for him, it builds that kind of excitement because I just can't wait to see him. And even those who, who are dead, they don't have a knowledge um, of the fact that they're dead. But as Dr. No, no shared, you know, they died in the Lord. And the next thing they're going to know, I'm alive in the Lord. So that's good news. And definitely we're coming to the end of time. Pastor, I just shared a very, very important submission as it relates to our hope and expectation. Matthew 24, and also the book of Revelation. And we see it in Luke 21 as well. The signs in Luke 24, and also by extension, sorry, Matthew 24, and by extension, Matthew 25, do give us a very important lesson in life because Jesus made it clear that he could have returned in the very generation. We have to live with that expectation that he can come in this very generation. There's still wars and pestilence and famine. The signs are current all around us. We know when a fig tree, uh, let me use a mango tree, a Julie mango tree is throwing a black blossom, that they're going to be mangoes. And so the world in each generation, Christ can come. And so I do not have an excuse. As Pastor, jo um, say Pastor Joseph, Elder Joseph asked the question earlier, Waiting and waiting, the signs are evidence that what the scripture says are true. We live in a groaning world. We live in a, in a world where the signs are just about fulfilled. My grandmother would have seen them. So Christ is saying in this generation or that generation or this generation, I could have come. But I only live in my generation. And I can only say in my generation, the signs are being fulfilled as well. And so I have to live as though Christ can come any day now. So those signs really help us to have that sense of expectation that it can be any day, it can be very soon, it can even be today. Amen. You know, you have been reinforcing the points, but I still need for us to drive it home a little bit more. So the question again, and I know you've been saying it, what hope can we take from the answer? The hope we have is in Christ um, because... Yeah. As I mentioned over and over, hope in someone is different to having hope in God. We have to look at one's ability. We have to, to look at one's um, 
track record. When we look at God's track record, he has never not fulfilled his promises. And so what hope we have, we can take from the fact that he's coming soon is that the track record shows that he has been faithful to his word. So let's continue to trust in him that no matter what you and I, we may be going through in this world, no matter how urgent we want him to come, we can trust in the word of God that if he says he will come, he will come and he will not tarry. Amen. Amen. I think Dr. Knowles um, answered it. I would just share the words of the song. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. As we read these passages from the book of Psalms, as we consider the whole concept of waiting, it creates that environment for hope. And the Bible says experience builds hope. And with hope, we will not be ashamed. And, and the track record shows, as Dr. No said, he can be trusted. And if I can trust you, I, I can definitely hope hope in you and we can trust him so we can hope in him amen we've had a tremendous experience through this book of psalms and i think i can speak for all of us that our experience have been greater because of this in-depth study of the book of psalms and so i'm going to ask two final questions for you as we sum up this whole book one i'm asking of you your takeaway for this week wait on the lord and then Afterwards, you'll come back and tell me your summation of this whole book of Psalms, the one thing you want all of us to hold on to in spite of from the study of Psalms. My takeaway for this week is really the concept of waiting. I think that was the major focus of the lesson for this week. But as we consider the age that we're living in, and the writer highlighted it in the first um, few days of the lesson, uh, we live in a busy world. You know, everything is instant. Individuals don't want to wait on the bank line. <laughs> Individuals don't want to wait, you know, as it relates to business transactions. It, we just want things to happen now, right? And as we consider the fact that God has called us to wait and the psalmist is crying out, wait, wait. I think that was the takeaway for me that I have to wait on God in my personal life, in what I desire of him. He may not always bring it to pass in the time I expect him to, and he wants me to wait, and I have to understand the importance of waiting on him. And and I think that's a major area for me. Um, secondly, I would say the fact that we're living on this planet and we want to come off the planet. Some people say, I wish I could get off this planet, but we have to wait. A time will come when we will we will come off the planet. We will be in the kingdom, but we have to wait until then. So that whole waiting aspect is really a part of the Christian experience and I embrace it today. And so this week, that was really major for me. I would just emphasize that waiting is a virtue and all of us as Christians need to grow in this area of our lives. To wait on God is to have confidence in him. Not to wait on God is to lack confidence in him. It takes having a relationship with God to wait with eager expectation in him. So if we are an impatient lot, we need to go back and check in, in the word, build our faith so that we can have confidence waiting on God. That would be my final word on that. And the grand finale, your takeaway from this quarter. Wow, what a quarter it has been. To be honest, coming out from God's mission, my mission, and I saw Psalms, you know, I, I said, no, my, God's mission, my mission was the best study ever written, especially the practical aspect of it on the Thursdays. It was never done before. And I was like, no, there's no practical, you know, illustrations and activity for the Thursday. I'm not going to really, but it's amazing. I said to someone, if the book of Psalms was the only book <laughs> that we had to read from the Bible, I think it would be enough to really show who God is. And I did not see the book of Psalms from that angle until this quarter. We saw God as creator in the book of Psalms. He is king. He is Lord. He is judge. He is the defender of the poor. He delivers. He forgives. And, and definitely salvation 
in Christ, the number of illustrations in the book of Psalms about who Christ is. And I think what was so beautiful is the different voices. We see the psalmist speaking. Jesus himself is talking about himself. The psalmist speaking about Christ. And just the way the writing is just so beautiful. And it is enough for us to really understand who God is and the salvation available to him. So uh, I really saw the book of Psalms from a different light than everything as we consider, whether it be doctrines of the Adventist faith, whether we consider everything that we need to know in our Christian journey from day one to make it to the kingdom. I saw it all play out beautifully in the book of Psalms. I was very excited about the journey and I look forward to reading more even after this quarter from, from the book of Psalms. That would be my, my summary. Yeah, just to add, I think the Psalms are extremely important because unlike the historical books or the prophetic books, which bring messages from God or just the historical books, writings about the people of God, the Psalms are really the expression of the heart of the people of God. They are their cognitive and emotional expression because of my experience this is what i'm saying because of what i'm going through this is how i'm expressing myself so it's really the heart of the writers and it speaks to what the writers are going through the perspective on life on forgiveness on salvation on the messiah to come in every aspect so it's really the heart of the writer so it's not necessarily like the prophet gets a vision from god it's really what impact does that vision have on the life of the individual that he would have spoken to and how God is moving that person's heart to respond to him. So all of us can be a psalmist because the word of God should touch us in a way that we start to sing, we start to recite, we start to reflect, we start to say what is on our mind. We get vexed with God. We tell him that we we get happy with him. We tell him that we get disappointed. We express that. So the Psalms really brings out another aspect of scripture, the human relational aspect of it. And I think that's the journey we have been in. And with that said, we should have had two quarters on the book of Psalm so we can dig a little deeper and bring out even more Amen. of the elements of the, of the Psalm. So that's my take on the book of Psalm. Uh, Dr. Knowles, I agree with you. This study of the Psalms leaves you wanting more. You know, it just seems as if we could do another quarter, truly. But what's about to happen? The explosion of our next quarter promises to be even more exciting. Caption, the great controversy. Truly, we're living in the end of time. And again, we're going back to look at something that's foundational to us as Christians and as Seventh-day Adventists. And so we invite you to join us for this upcoming study from tomorrow, The Great Controversy. And truly, I want to thank both of you for spending part of my birthday with me, but more so, thank you for sharing with us here on Whispering Hope throughout the Book of Psalms. As usual, I ask God's blessings over your ministries, over your family, and I ask that he will continue to Grow the intellect so you can teach us more. And so to all of Whispering Hope, thank you for being our support. Thank you for always being tuned in with us in the morning. We love and we appreciate you. So until tomorrow, God bless.